So uh, I just want to take one moment here to uh, introduce our speaker to you. Alan told me uh, before services that as little as I could say about him as possible would be, be better. And uh, I cannot put the pressure on him that I want to put on him by saying as little as possible. So I'm going to say a little bit more this morning. Uh, just to let you know, uh, it, it is really an honor and a privilege uh, to have somebody like Alan with us today. And uh, I really, I just marvel at sometimes the opportunities we have uh, and the blessings we have to have great people of God uh, with us like this. And uh, I hope you hope you relish uh, this opportunity that we have. Uh, somewhere along the line, as we were talking about Alan this week in my home, because we uh, met out at uh, out in Arkansas, and Alan was traveling back with us. And I guess my kids didn't know exactly who it was, so they kept saying that man. And somewhere between my girls and William, that ended up being translated as Batman. And just a moment ago, William looked at Olivia and said, hey, there's Batman. <laughs> so uh, we have Batman uh, speaking for us today. But you may remember, Alan, he's been here two or three years ago uh, and, and spoke for us then, but it hasn't been, it's only been that one time. And so it's uh, really a blessing to have him back here. And his, I guess, in similarity to, to Batman, his identity is somewhat disguised. You wouldn't know all the things about him. Even I am still learning uh, amazing things about him. And last night as we were traveling together, I should have said this up front, but for those of you who don't remember this, Alan founded The Word Is Out, and that's the organization that now uh, Brad Johnson is the president of. And so I, I see Alan twice a year at these meetings that we have, and that's why he's here now. He lives in Ireland now. He's going back to Ireland. Spent, spent years as a missionary in Kenya and, and traded time between there and the United States, but now he resides in Ireland. Uh, as we were traveling back last night, though, he was he was telling me about some things. That, I don't know how many of you guys might have seen the movie or read the book Unbroken, but I read it years ago. Louis Zamperini, and we were talking about the, the, uh, that story, and I said, oh, that's a great book. And Alan said, oh, yeah, he used to be on my staff in uh, uh, church. And uh, one of his uh, grandkids is named after Louis Zamperini, actually, because of their, their closeness. And uh, uh, before that, we were talking. I was telling him about my biggest theological influences and uh, I said, uh, yeah, you know a guy named Dallas Willard? He said, oh, yeah, Dallas used to attend my church uh, in uh, California. I was like, what in the world? <laughs> I knew he had kind of a cult following uh, uh, among the people I was around. I, I came onto this board, and I was like the only one who wasn't like, ha didn't have posters of Alan Meenan in my house. Uh, but, uh, but I'm learning more and more, I think, about why he is such a big deal to people. Uh, uh, but he's really... Uh, I've been around him for years now, and I would commend him to you for who he is. Uh, and I'm just more impressed with him all the time, really. So thankful for, for him. And I'll tell you one more thing about him that just amazed me. Uh, last minute, as you guys who were in the class this morning know, last minute, uh, we, we handed off the, the class to Alan. And really, still on the way back, we were discussing what he should talk about. And he said, well, what book of the Bible? You want me to just talk about a book? What book of the Bible you want me to talk about? And I said something along the lines of, to be clear, like, you're giving me 66 options here to talk about the whole book. He said, yeah. <laughs> I don't know anybody. <laughs> I, I know a lot of people who are very educated. I don't know anybody who would volunteer last minute to talk about any book of the Bible, the whole thing. But that's what he did last night. He's a, he's a scholar and a pastor and a missionary and somebody who just loves the Word of God. And, of course, you know, if I manage to live as long as he does, has, then I think I will probably get there in my understanding. But I still have a very long way to go. Um, and I say that jokingly. Um, I want to ask one thing as you, as you come up, Alan. I don't care if you do it at the beginning or at the end, but I want you to pray for us. Um, I love to hear Alan pray, and when you hear Alan pray, uh, you see who he is. So you, you choose your time, but I want you to pray over this church before you're done, please. All right. Would you guys welcome Dr. Alan Meenan with me? This is embarrassing. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting, you know, that... Oh, 
Can I have some water? Can you bring that water to me? That's great. Um, when they were fitting me with this, this, uh, these, um, whatever they're called, around your neck, the microphone, um, it was kind of interesting that uh, someone said, do you want to be up on the platform or do you want to be uh, on the floor? And I said, I don't care, you know, whatever, whatever, I don't care. Up, down, you know. And he kind of looked at me and he said, I think you need to be up so they can see you. <laughs> and then I noticed when Luke came, he lowered this. Did you notice? <laughs> he lowered this really way down, so I hope you can see me. Um, Anyway, it's lovely to be here. I just, I love this church and, and love your pastor. I think you are incredibly fortunate and blessed with the pastor that you have. Um, I travel the world and, uh, and Luke is an amazing man. Um, and I hope you, uh, you treat him well. He's, he's great. Um, so if you have your Bible with you, will you turn to, uh, to John chapter 21 as we read it together? I want to focus on these verses that you read in, in, uh, from verse so... Uh, Verse 15 and following. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to them, said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Father, may the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer, and we love you so. In Christ's name, amen. I have always felt that John 21 doesn't belong. Have you ever felt that way? When you're reading through the Gospel of John, when you get to the end of chapter 21, John seems to end. Have you noticed? He seems to end his Gospel. It's an incredible Gospel, perhaps the most popular Gospel of, of all of them. But when you get to the end of chapter 21, so have a look at the end of chapter 21, the last couple of verses, verses 30 and 31. He basically says, and this is the purpose, this is why I have written, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not recorded in this book. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you have, may have life in his name. Wow! Wow! What a great book. What a great way to end. What a great conclusion. And so the book comes to its end in chapter 20. Christ is risen. The disciples believe. And he makes his final appeal to the reader. So why is there another chapter? Why did John stick on another chapter when it so perfectly concludes in chapter 20? Well, if you look at verse 1, you may find a clue there. Many scholars will point out that uh, chapter 21 is to reveal the person of Jesus because it says here, afterwards Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Some versions say that he manifested himself. Literally, it means that he shone forth. And many will say, well, it's because we want to concretize the fact that he was risen physically. He was a real person. There is a fire going. There are fish being cooked. He's eating the fish. He's not an hallucination. He's a real person. He is risen from the dead. He is real. It is not a figment of anyone's imagination. I'm happy with that. But I wonder if there's more here. 
because chapter 21, dare I say this, it's one of the most beautiful chapters in all the Bible. It is a scene of pictorial beauty. It is set by the Sea of Galilee, a place that was familiar to the disciples. Jesus had already appeared to them in the upper room. Many days had passed since then, and now there is a, a change of scenery, and seven of the disciples return to the Galilee where the adventure all began. And so chapter 21 brings the gospel to a second end, if you will, to the place where it all started. In many ways, it's recollection. When you get older, you tend to recollect a lot more. Now, most of you aren't there yet, but one of the things, you young people, let me encourage you with your grandparents, someday just sit down and ask a question, what, what was it like in the good old days? And if you want to start them talking, they'll just talk and talk and talk. They'll remember what America was like 50, 60, 70 years ago. And you will learn a lot from them. Recollection is such a lovely, wonderful thing. So here you have a scene of recollection. We are by the Sea of Galilee. The, the sea is calm. The moon lies fair upon the strait. The sporadic lights of the, of the hills on the far side of the lake are shining in the, in the water, and the, you have that rhythmic pulse of the water uh, coming in and going out, swishing as it goes and as it comes, echoing a strange melancholy, if you will, to a weary group of men who'd been trying to fish all night but had found nothing. Again and again they threw in the nets. Again and again they hauled up the nets. Again and again they threw them in and hauled them up, only to the sound of escaping water. And the night had felt long and arduous and depressing. One of those men was Simon Peter. And sometimes I wonder as I read this story if Peter's mind perhaps wandered back to the last time that he'd sailed a boat on that highland lake. When the sea was like glass then as well, there was no breath of wind and they were not able to catch any fish that time either. And, and Jesus asked them to try again. These are seasoned fishermen. And this stranger is saying, well, try it again. And they thought, not how stupid the suggestion was. But they did what the stranger had said. And, well, you know the story. There was so much fish that they caught that they thought the boats were, were going to sink. And so here we have Peter back at the old life, back at the old occupation, back in the old fishing boat, back in the old way of life. Here was a man who had left it all behind one spring morning when a stranger had appeared and invited him to become not a fisher of fish, but a fisher of man. His life was never going to be the same. Everything, everything had changed. There was never a day like that in his entire life. He left everything, and he followed Jesus. But I want you to catch the irony of this. Because here he is back at the old life, back in the old fishing boat, back as if those amazing three years had, had never, ever happened. The adventure was over. It was finished. He'd had his chance. He had broken his troth. He had disowned his Lord. He swore three times that he never knew him. Three times he trampled the lovely name of Jesus beneath his feet. And Peter knew he was not fit for the kingdom. He had failed miserably. This Christianity business was just too difficult. And so he goes back to the life that he knows. 
something he knows he can do. He goes back fishing, back to the nets. Others may follow this Jesus. But for him, the adventure was over. The, the lovely dream of a, of a new tomorrow, a new kingdom, it was gone forever. He had failed miserably. <sighs> if only it had another chance, maybe he would do it differently. I imagine that Peter was going through all those, dilemma, the, those dilemmas and thoughts. Feeling sad at heart. He just hadn't made it. And then there was a stranger on the shore. Any fish? Have you caught any fish? cried the stranger. And then he told them this stupid thing. Why did you throw your net on the other side? That's like kind of asking a couple who are going to get married, you know, and they've gone through all the pre-marriage marriage counseling and all the rest, and they come before you. And one of the most stupid questions I think we ministers have ever asked is, do you, do you take this woman to be your wedded wife? <laughs> I keep imagining somebody to say, why do you think I'm here? <laughs> Throw your net on the other side. Really, are you crazy? And so they throw their net on the other side. Now, it's John who recognizes Jesus, and he, he turns and he whispers to Peter, and he says, Peter, it's the Master. Oh, my goodness. And the next few hours seemed like a lifetime. Peter alone with Jesus, and, and that's why this chapter is there. This immortal scrap of dialogue is there for our edification. It's there to show us just what intimacy with Jesus is really like. This is the kind of intimacy I long to have with Jesus Christ. In this scrap of dialogue between Peter and Jesus. And I'm going to point out three things this morning. The first of all, we have a devastating demand. Now, we're going to see that it's unique, we're going to see that it's undeviating, and we're going to see that it's uncompromising. But let's look at each of those in turn. First of all, I want you to notice that this question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three times he asked the question. Three times Peter was vexed at answering it. Why three times? Well, obviously, it has to do with the three times that Simon Peter denied Jesus Christ. And so he asks him three times. Three times Peter had said, I don't know him. I don't know this Jesus. Leave me alone. Three times he plunged that poison dagger into the heart of love. Three times he needed to be forgiven. For every time that he denied him, Jesus said, do you love me? And every time he said, I love you, he undid that denial. I love it because it was a unique question. You know, I, I love this about when Jesus confronts someone, he says, Simon, I'm talking to you, Simon. You know, it's interesting when we come to church, oftentimes, you know, we're sitting there thinking, well, this would be a good message for my neighbor. Or I hope the person sitting beside me is getting this. But Jesus doesn't let us off the hook like that, does he? He calls you by name, Dorothy, Harry, Thomas. Do you love me? Do you love me? Not the person beside you. It's a unique, personal, intimate question. And it's an undeviating question. There's nothing complicated about it. You don't need a PhD in theology to answer this question. There's something terribly simple about it. There's no system of theology. He gets to the heart of the matter, to where the rubber meets the road. This is the breathtaking simplification of religion. He doesn't ask about what creed do you belong, do you, do you believe. This is not about 
creeds, our conduct, our isms, our ologies. It is simply this, Simon, do you love me? Wow. You know, I find it ironic that I find the best definition of love outside of Scripture was written by a Roman Catholic priest above all others, Michel Quast, a French priest. And he said this, love is leaving oneself and going towards another. I don't know that there's a more perfect definition than that. Because at the heart of love is the giving up of self. Selfishness is the very opposite. It is the greatest obstacle to love. And so unless we are fully surrendered, we cannot fully love. It depends upon how much we love. And Sunday by Sunday, you hear the message of love and, and you're asked to fall in love with someone you've never seen. It's a love relationship at the heart of faith. And it reminds me of the story. You remember Abraham sent his servant to find a, a wife for Isaac. And the servant made his long journey and eventually sits at a well and Rebecca comes out and the servant knows that this is the woman for my master's son. And so they enter into dialogue and, and, and the family of Rebecca call her in and they say to her, now just paint this picture of she's standing there in front of her family, her father, mother, siblings. Do you want to go with this guy? Do you want to go across deserts and across rivers and mountain ranges? to marry a man that you've never seen. And Rebecca looks at her family and in those lovely words she says, I will go. I will go love a man whom I have never seen. The Apostle Peter says something like that in his first epistle, first chapter, the eighth verse. He says, whom you've never seen, but whom you love, even though you have never seen. Love is surrendering the self. So often, we're holding on to something that we need to let go of to be fully surrendered. You, you remember the story of Moses? Moses carried that rod, that wonderful rod around with him everywhere he went, and uh, and God said to him, what's that in your hand, Moses? And he said, well, it's my rod. God said, throw it away. What? Throw it away. No. Lord, you don't understand. This is my rod. It's my rod. I got this rod. I like this rod. Throw it away. Uh, no, I, Lord, we're not communicating well here. Um, it would do no good for me to throw it away. God said, throw it away. And of course, he throws it away. And then God catches up with him 10 miles down the road because it has turned into a snake. And he says, go back and pick it up. What is it that we're holding on to that stops us from letting go? Will you go and marry this man? I will go. And it's an uncompromising question. He adds these words, do you love me, Simon, more than these, more than everything else? Do you love me that much? And I suspect he's talking about, he's looking at, at, at all the other disciples. Do you love me more than the other disciples? Do you love me more than family? Do you love me more than James and John and Andrew? Uh, how much do you love me? Some suggest that maybe he's pointing to the boats, the fishing nets, do you love me more than your occupation? Do you love me more than the things that bring you joy? Do you love me more than your hobbies? And... But basically, it's the same thing, isn't it? Jesus is asking, do you love me above everything else? 
There are no half measures here. Someone has said, and I love this, that if Christ isn't worth bothering about wholeheartedly, he's not worth bothering about. Wow. If Jesus Christ is not worth bothering about wholeheartedly, he's not worth bothering about. Peter says to you, he is precious. You see, Simon had to be sure of Peter's love. He didn't ask him, how sorry are you for letting me dine? Isn't that interesting? Do you love me? That was the, that was the all-important question. It kind of reminds me of that prostitute that we read of in Luke chapter 7. And Jesus said, much is forgiven her, not because she wept, but because she loved. Simon, do you love me? When we had membership classes in the churches that I pastored and ministered to, there were other pastors who basically taught the, the, the course of becoming a member. All the aspects of what a Christian is, what this church does, and so forth and so on, to introduce us to the life of the church. And I would come in at the very end before they were ready to, to join the church. And, and basically, I would say, you've been through all this, but essentially, when I ask you all these questions that my denomination tell me I need to ask you to become a member of the church, it all boils down to one question. I'm really asking you one question, only one question, and the question is this. And by the way, I will never ask you this question again. I will ask you at one time and never again. What is the question? Do you love Jesus? And if you love Jesus, we love to have you as a member of the church but I will never ask you that question again. I will substitute it with a different question. From now on, I will ask you as a member of the church, not do you love him, but how much do you love him and will you love him more? And that's what we have here. Peter answers in, the, in his, what I call the disciples' declaration, Jesus, you know that I love you. Unfortunately, we lose this in the English translation, but basically, Jesus is saying, do you, uh, do you agape me? Which is the highest form of love. It's redemptive love. Do you, do you agape me? And, and, and Peter says, I, I phileo you. It's an affectionate. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really affectionate towards you. And we miss that in the English. And Jesus asks him again, do you agape me? And he says, no, I feel it with you. And then Jesus says, thirdly, do you feel it with me? He comes down to Peter's level and he says, even, even at your reduced level of love, Peter, I understand that you're saying that this love is far too great for you to embrace, but even at your level, do you love me even in your best understanding of love? That's why we read here that when Jesus said, uses his word, it says that Peter was vexed. No wonder. Can you tell me even by your standard that you love me? And so Peter needs to prove his love. But how can he do that? His record is denial. His record is failure. He's flunked out as a Christian. He hasn't been a good Christian. He hasn't been a good disciple. He wants to make amends. How can he convince Jesus Christ of his love? To what should he make his appeal? There's only one thing. Jesus knew that everything Peter had suffered, what he'd been through, the shame, the defeat, the sense of failure, and so he appealed to the understanding heart of Jesus. I think that's lovely. Jesus, you know all things. You know that I love you. And that's true for us as well. You know, Jesus knows your failures. He knows you've let him down. He knows you've hurt the heart of God. He knows you haven't given him priority in your life. He understands the plight. He's ready to forgive. And all we need to say is, Lord, 
My love is faltering. I can't prove I keep failing you. I'm not the best disciple in the world. But you know my heart. And you know that I love you. And then finally, there's the divine directive. Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Undo your love, in other words. Give it away. You've heard the definition that evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. And you know the story of the three beggars outside the gate in Samaria when Sennacherib and was attacking the northern kingdom and a disease had spread through the camp and people inside Samaria were starving to death. They had no food to eat. They were reduced to eating rats. And the three beggars outside, they were starving to death. They didn't even have rats to eat. And one said to the other, you know, let's, let's go into the camp of the, the Assyrians and beg for food because the least they can do is kill us and we're going to die anyway. And so they ventured over and they went into a tent and no one was there. Can you imagine? And they saw this table full of food. And they just gobbled it up, and they went to the next tent. They were waiting for a century to say, Halt, who goes forth? No one called. And they went into one tent after the other. They were eating their fill. Until one beggar turned to the other and said, This is a day of glad tidings, and we are holding our peace. The people in the city are starving. We need to go and tell them there's food. Feed my sheep. Mary Martin was a Broadway musical star. She, was, uh, she starred in South Pacific on Broadway. And Oscar Hammerstein was the great director in those days. And he was on his deathbed when he wrote Mary Martin a little note as she performed in South Pacific. The note read simply this, Dear Mary, a bell's not a bell till you ring it. A song's not a song till you sing it. Love in your heart is not put there to stay. Love is not love till you give it away. And it is said that that night, Mary Martin sang her heart out. And everybody flocked afterwards at the side of the stage. They said, Mary, Mary, that was incredible. That was wonderful. I, that we've never seen you sing like that. What happened tonight? And she handed them the little note, and she said, tonight I gave my love away. My dear brothers and sisters, Christ asked, do you love me? And if you do, will you Will you give your, your love away? Spend it out. Feed my sheep. For as much as you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. That the world might know that you are my disciples if you love, for each, if you love each other. Now think about the folly of this. I might be inclined to say to Jesus, Jesus, do you know what you're doing? He let you down. He let you, he let you down. Get it? He let you down. He denied you. Why would you trust him again? I remember in one of my churches, there was a, a lady in the women's organization, and she blew it. And the rest of the women were let down, and they said, we're never going to let her in leadership again. And I remember pleading her cause on the basis of this passage. Because the amazing thing about Jesus Christ is that even though we let him down and disappoint him, he gives us greater responsibility than ever before. How can you, how can you not love a Savior like that? When you let him down, he says, I'll give you more today. And that's what he did here. And Peter heard once more the gracious invitation follow me. And he left his boat a second time. Can I tell you one of my favorite verses in Scripture? I have so many, but you know, the one that really strikes me is Jonah 3 verse 1. 
And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I love that. God didn't give up on Jonah. I would have given up on Jonah. Aren't you glad I'm not God? (laughs) He never gives up on us. He is the God of the second chance. And we read in the book of Acts that Peter died at last. He died being crucified upside down on a cross in Rome. He suffered for this Jesus whom he loved because he knew he would never walk alone again. He loved much because Jesus trusted him despite everything. That's my message to you from this. This is why this chapter is there. If today you feel weary and worn down by life, if you feel that you've failed him, you've not been the disciple that you would like to have been, John is telling us from his own experience and from the experience of Simon Peter that Jesus Christ is trusting you more than ever. Despite your failures, he's still trusting. He's still loving. You just can't get away from his love. He just can't stop. Even though you stick a dagger, even though you say, I don't know him, he doesn't stop loving. He doesn't stop trusting. But he comes along our side at such moments and he whispers in our ear, Sarah, Jane, John, do you love me? Because ultimately that's the only really important thing. And do you love me with all your heart? Am I King of kings and Lord of lords? And if you do, will you spill out that love? Will you spend it? Will you feed my sheep? It was George Matheson who penned the lovely words that we often sing. O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. He penned those words after a physician told him that he was going to lose his sight and become blind. He went to his fiancée and he gave her the freedom to leave the relationship. She elected to do so. Alone and feeling unloved, he was encompassed by his understanding of of the God who never stopped loving him. And so he penned those gracious, wonderful words. Will you pray with me? Almighty Father, as we hear the whisper of your Spirit to our souls this morning, do we love you? It's easy to say yes. But Father, do we love you with more than anything else? A little more difficult to say yes. Because we know, Father, that we have let you down, every one of us. It's not so much that we've sinned greatly, but we've not lived up to the calling of Christ in our lives. None of us. And we're sorry. But you know our hearts. As best we are able, we whisper in return in the silence of these moments, yes, Jesus, we do love you. With all our hearts, we love you. And we are determined to share that love, 
to a whole world that is in desperate need of this amazing story of the gospel. The greatest person who has ever graced the earth, the most wonderful and attractive of people, and a message of hope and love and joy and peace that only you can bring. We want others to experience that joy as well. So, Father, hear our prayer. We are your people, far from perfect. As best we are able, we will love you that we might experience the joy in all its fullness, the peace that passes understanding, and the amazing sense of your presence in our lives, and a glorious love relationship that we would share with others. Hear our prayer. In Christ's precious name, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.